Hi folks, how's everything going? This is uh, Dr. Pickett. Uh, first off, I'd like to apologize for my uh, um, little slide commentary here. Uh, being a little late in summer, uh, after school was out, um, we had, as you might imagine, a lot of uh, new and last minute um, requests for assistance with the pre-health committee and uh, with students who were um, preparing for their MCAS applications. And so uh, unfortunately, uh, some of my uh, teaching got pushed a little bit into the future, but we're doing it now. So this slide commentary will be for lecture 13. You should already have had access to the PowerPoints. However, I will also uh, arrange either through um, Google Drive or through uh, Microsoft OneDrive to make sure that you have access to the PowerPoint. Um, you know, I, I can't uh, post the artwork uh, from the text on YouTube, and I thought that would be the most efficient way to uh, distribute this because I believe the Sakai site has now closed down. So, I, I hope we'll go ahead and do uh, lecture 13 today. Um, we'll get as much of that done as I can. And then uh, I'll also do lecture, lecture 14 post that. And I'll be distributing the links uh, through the uh, shared email uh, listserv that we have. Uh, and so please don't hesitate to give me a call or hesitate to uh, send me an email if you have any questions. Uh, concerns, etc. Uh, another thing that has come up has been um, uh, taking an opportunity to go over the exam. So we are in the point now uh, where Loyola is beginning to do a little bit of uh, giving faculty a bit more access to campus. And so I hope I'll have more news about that in just a bit. Okay. So for lecture 13, we're going to be talking about uh, the logic, if you will, of eukaryotic gene expression. And just to draw that kind of as a contradistinction to what we've talked about up to this point, where we've discussed the LAC operon, we've discussed transcription and translation as general biochemical processes. Um, I just want to uh, reacquaint you with some of the same key concepts that we talked about when, for instance, we've talked about things like cis regulatory sites in the LAC operon, like the LAC promoter, or cis regulatory sites like the operator, or um, the catabolite activating protein, cyclic AMP binding protein binding site. Um, that, you know, if we're thinking about cis regulatory sites. Well, remember, every cis regulatory site in DNA also has a partner protein that binds to it. And so cis regulatory sites and trans acting factors like transcription regulatory proteins have to work together in partnership. So we'll see that this is a commonality whether we're discussing prokaryotes or eukaryotes. Um, so what I would like to do to begin with is to direct you to slide two in the presentation, which is my uh, famous biological information processing flow of information as uh, we transition from the storage form in DNA to the intermediate form in RNA. That's through the process of templated DNA transcription by RNA polymerase. And uh, remember, the RNA polymerase will be reading uh, towards the five prime end of the template in order to be synthetically adding to the three prime or hydroxyl end of the mRNA. So it is collinear, but if you'll remember, complementary uh, from our previous discussion. Uh, so we're going to be making a sort of transient helix using the synthetic process of RNA polymerization creating a hybrid uh, molecule transiently where we have uh, a newly synthesized strand of RNA 
complemented to our DNA template strand. The next step in information retrieval and processing is translation, where the linear sequence of the three nucleotide codons, starting again with the start codon and ending finally with the stop codon, uh, are translated using the sequence of three nucleotides, three nucleotides, three nucleotides in the reading frame on the mRNA. We're going to be seeing very similar processes in eukaryotes and in prokaryotes. Um, one thing I do want to remind you is we do see occasionally, and this is particularly true in the context of eukaryotic disease processes, that um, informational information retrieval can run in reverse, where RNA sequences can, through the activity of reverse transcriptase, um, be interconverted back into DNA, again in template-mediated, but in this case it's an RNA template that is available, mediated polymerization of DNA by a um, reverse transcriptase and RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So that just kind of context is for where we're getting to. Um, we're going to talk a lot more now about uh, the regulatory inputs into a diversity of eukaryotic genes and uh, gene situations, bits of genes uh, that are determining when that flow of information will occur, i.e. under what conditions will a gene be transcribed and translated, or under what conditions will a protein be uh, converted either by change in conformation or through addition of another molecule like a phosphate group or uh, another uh, structure like a small sugar being converted from a inactive to an active form or an active to an active form. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, though, is unfortunately in eukaryotic uh, biology, we haven't, shall we say, settled upon the perfect example gene, <laughs> the, the, the eukaryotic equivalent of a lac operon that is kind of universally understood and whose regulatory logic is extremely well understood. Uh, that's used kind of universally across all of biology teaching the way we kind of use the LAC operon or the arabinose operon or the TRIP operon um, in terms of prokaryotic biology. So they're going to be, it's going to feel a little bit like we're doing a collection of kind of just so stories. Um, Hopefully I, that won't be too confusing, but that's one challenge that I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of students have communicated with me, in particular with dealing with the Clug and Cummings text that um, feels like we're kind of diving into something like Drosophila sex determination or um, stress response genes and then kind of coming back out and uh, going from different levels of understanding and uh, I, I certainly share that frustration in looking at the text uh, and just say that unfortunately this is a situation where because of the complexity we're dealing with with eukaryotic gene expression, um, we don't have a simple model system. Now, uh, one of my old professors <laughs> uh, at Indiana University used to always uh, talk about uh, his eukaryotic model gene, which was the YFG gene. Uh, YFG stand, stood for your favorite gene. Um, this was Dr. Jose Bonner. His favorite gene was a completely simulated, made-up gene called dibibliomuctase. Dibibliomuctase's biochemical job, as far as any of us uh, could tell, was to confuse the scientific literature. So, um, uh, we'll be talking a lot about model genes, a lot about YFGs. We're going to be kind of moving between a conceptual and a specific level a fair amount. Um, please send me an email if anything's confusing, and I'll try to add as much clarity as I possibly can.
Okay, <clears throat> so let's transition here to our third slide. This is the slide titled Comparison of Prokaryotic and Eukaryotic Gene Organization and Cis Regulatory Elements. Here, the figure is divided into two pieces. Uh, one, we're uh, referring back to the LAC operon, uh, and we see a start site of transcription. We see the cap binding site. We see the promoter, the operator, um, and then we have that red line, which simply indicates the bacterial chromosome. Um, so we'll talk a little bit again about LAC operon and just think about cis regulatory elements in the context of the regulation of that gene. Then under that, I have a YFG. It's just a eukaryotic gene cartoon, um, just showing a little similarity and a little difference uh, as we're comparing and contrasting prokaryotic and eukaryotic genes. And I've just kind of assembled a little gene model uh, from a diverse set of references just to give you some idea about how their structures are similar and also distinct in relation to something like an operon. So if we start with the LAC operon, what do we see as we move along the stretch of DNA? Well, again, we have our start site of transcription. That's the little bar rising from above the chromosome with an arrow leading off that indicates the five prime end where the bar connects with uh, the chromosome of the resulting RNA transcript and the arrowhead is the three prime hydroxyl or the three prime end of that transcript. Um, immediately uh, at the region where you see the bar coming up, the start of transcription, you see three cis regulatory sites indicated. Uh, CAP, that is the binding site for cyclic AMP binding protein, uh, cat catabolite activating protein, depending on which literature you wish to refer to, immediately downstream of that and immediately adjacent to it in the DNA. If you'll uh, refer back um, to the DNA sequence level structure of the operon that we talked about immediately, literally one nucleotide away from the footprint or binding site for the catabolite activating protein, we have the minus 35, minus 10 site, the uh, promoter region, and overlapping with um, the more three prime region of the promoter, we have the operon, which is the binding site for LAC repressor. So one thing that we see with uh, LAC operon is that the cis regulatory regions are extremely compact are immediately adjacent and even embedded in each other, if we think about the operator, in relation to the start site of transcription. Now, if we move down just a bit and look at a YFG, a eukaryotic gene model, um, what do we see? Well, we see some things that we would anticipate being there given what we know uh, for bacterial genes. We see a promoter. We see a start site of transcription, little line coming up from the chromosome and then the arrowhead uh, leading off to the right. Um, we see a transcript form, good old RNA polymerase is uh, causing a transcript to occur. Um, but another thing we see are lots of other little sites scattered around the DNA. We see sites A and B are very far, far upstream, um, five prime in relation to the start site of transcription, more three prime in relation to the template. Uh, we see uh, A, B, and C. These are cis regulatory sites located some distance away from the start site of transcription, but analogous to CAP and analogous to promoter and analogous to operator, proteins bind, DNA binding proteins bind to those sites and influence whether or not the promoter initiates transcription. Um, you'll notice if we look at uh, D and E that there are cis-regulatory sites in this particular gene model that are embedded in an intron uh, between exon one and two, that's site D, and site E is even three prime past 
uh, the termination site for transcription. So cis-regulatory elements in eukaryotic genes can be scattered broadly around the gene. Um, famous cis-regulatory sites, one of which I've already discussed in class, the um, enhancer of split, a barb wakamoto, uh, that is a cis-regulatory site in which the protein that binds to it can interact with uh, the core transcriptional machinery at an incredibly long distance. And I've also talked with you guys, I don't know if you remember um, about the sonic hedgehog um, major upstream enhancer, almost a million base pairs away from the start site of transcription. So those cis-regulatory sites scattered broadly along the chromosome that's not something we're used to seeing with prokaryotic genes. With eukaryotic genes, you can have landing pads for these proteins all over the chromosome, and they have the ability, through a very interesting process, of interacting with the core transcriptional machinery of the promoter. Now, another thing you'll notice about the little YFG here is it is an interrupted gene, as we uh, see with many genes in eukaryotes. There are uh, the exons, the um, stretches of DNA uh, containing codons, which will ultimately be seen in their complementary form in the mRNA that is present. But then you also have these intervening sequences or introns, um, which although they are present in the transcript prior to its maturation, we've talked broadly about eukaryotic transcription previously, they must be spliced out by the spliceosome and other splicing machinery in order for the exons to be brought into a covalent association with each other, um, again, through a phosphodiester backbone, analogous to what we see with a, a stretch of DNA polymer. Um, so we've got to splice out that intervening mRNA to bring the exons together. Why uh, that reassembly of all of the exons adjacent to each other um, with a phosphodiester uh, polymer chain uh, binding them all together is absolutely required for there to be an entire and intact reading frame so that with the start site of translation or the start of translation, all the way through uh, the stop uh, signal for translation, the nonsense codon, we can ultimately translate an entire protein through that region. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is remember, the transcript for uh, the LAC operon contains within it three distinct open reading frames, three distinct start sites for uh, translation of proteins. Um, we, if you'll remember, we called those polycystronic messages. A single mRNA can be independently read by three different ribosomes to translate three distinct proteins. That's not generally, now there's, there's some interesting issues out there that we'll talk about in just a bit. But that's not generally what we see with any given mRNA in eukaryotes, where we will see one start codon, one stop codon, and one open reading frame translated faithfully uh, throughout that region. Um, another thing to remember, and this is something that I think uh, gives uh, students a little bit of pause, uh, we talked about co-transcriptional translation with prokaryotic genes, where an mRNA, as it emerges from RNA polymerase, can immediately be interacted with by the ribosome and then translation can initiate. Uh, remember, because of the process of splicing, because of the process of five prime uh, methylglonosine capping, three prime cleavage and then polyadenylation of the three prime end of the transcript during conversion of a pre-mRNA to a mature mRNA, so, so remember, transcription is occurring in a specific subcellular compartment in the eukaryotes, that is the nucleus. Um, ribosomes are not present in the nucleus. Splicing, maturation, but then ultimately export of the 
mature mRNA must be performed to allow it to transition between different subcellular spaces to exit the nucleus and end up out in the cytoplasm where it can interact with the eukaryotic translation initiation factors, uh, can interact with the uh, small subunit of the ribosome, can produce um, the initiation complex, and then finally be translated. So although we can see co-transcriptional translation in prokaryotes, we will not see that phenomena in eukaryotes because transcription of the pre-mRNA is occurring in the nucleus and only with processing of the RNA to form a mature RNA and export of the nucleus will we finally have access to that mRNA by the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. So <clears throat> thinking about eukaryotic uh, gene expression, we've got a few things we've got to deal with. We're going to have cis regulatory sites that are at quite some distance. We're going to be doing splicing. We may have alternative splicing where some exons are lost as large introns because of regulated splicing. And uh, this is an interesting phenomenon and is somewhat controversial. We know that alternative splicing happens relatively commonly. I've discussed that with you previously, but we also suspect based on the fact that some of the reported uh, alternative splicing sequences that we see in databases are not translatable, uh, that some of what we see in the databases of alternative splice forms of genes uh, may in fact be um, error, uh, that we're probably getting a lot of alternative splice forms that are aberrant splice um, side products or they're simply mistakes, but because we have such incredibly sensitive sequencing, RNA sequencing um, capabilities now, we can still capture that information even though those transcripts are unlikely to be integrated into the life of the cell. Um, they may play roles doing things like sopping up other small complementary RNAs. We'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Uh, but um, I think it's interesting that we see in these databases, oftentimes for some genes, many, many, many alternative splice forms. But if you dive a little deeper into their sequence, uh, look at their relative abundance uh, at different times and places in development or in the life of the cell. Um, it is unlikely that all of those alternative splice forms are under evolutionary selection or are playing important roles in the physiology of the cell. Okay, so if we move to slide four again, uh, I'm just here highlighting again the structure of the eukaryotic gene. So transitioning to slide five, uh, I'm just emphasizing here that everything we've talked about up to this point in terms of the flow of information from the cell, activation of transcription, splicing, uh, RNA stability, and then even post-translationally, alternative conformations, assembly, of multiple subunits into larger subunits, uh, post-translational modification by addition of phosphates, sugars, other small molecules. Um, regulation in eukaryotes can has an, have an impact at all of those levels. So that's not that much different than what we've seen with prokaryotes. You know, if you'll remember um, the go or no-go decision of the LAC operon is essentially determined by two cis regulatory sites, the cap binding site and the uh, operator, and their two um, transacting partners, the cyclic AMP binding protein, catabolite activating protein, and repressor protein, and their two small effector molecules that interact with those proteins. Um, in one case, cyclic AMP, which remember, its concentration rises as glucose uh, starvation occurs in cells. And um, the repressor protein, which interacts with its small effector molecule, allolactose. 
So um, regulation is occurring at a lot of different levels conceptually. Um, the switch might be a small molecule interacting with a larger protein, then that protein binding to DNA or releasing DNA uh, based on interacting with or failing to interact with a cis-regulatory site. Uh, conceptually very similar to what we've looked at now, but just up to this point, but just a little bit more complex with eukaryotes. Okay, let's transition to slide six. So as is true with uh, our prokaryotic genes that we've discussed, here in section 17.3, uh, what will we discover? We will discover that eukaryotic transcription initiation is regulated uh, using specific cis-regulatory sites. Now, one thing I want to remind you of is the fact uh, that we can have mutations that impact cis-regulatory sites. Cis-regulatory sites, their specific DNA sequence can be corrupted. Nucleotides can be gained lost, um, exchanged, uh, rather than GCCC, maybe the sequence is AAAAT. Well, <laughs> that's a considerable change. Um, I bring that up because if you'll remember, we talked about corrupting mutations in the CAP binding site, corrupting mutations in the operon, that a uh, operator allele, O superscript C, for constitutive transcription under glucose uh, starvation, that is a mutant allele of the LAC operon that occurs only because the operator itself is mutated and a repressor can no longer bind to it. So we will be exploring a little bit some of the impact of different cis-regulatory mutations in the context of eukaryotic genes and that will be quite important for assessing uh, the reality of their functional integration into the biochemical life of the cell. In fact, uh, site-directed mutation, mutating and changing individual nucleotides or small groups of nucleotides is very important in confirming the functional reality of a uh, cis-regulatory site that we've identified by gene finding. We may see something that is a ta-ta box uh, based on similarity to other ta-ta boxes and other genes. But if we mutate it, if we change its sequence and all of a sudden transcription crashes, it's not uh, as efficient as it was previously. Ah, we have confirmed functionally that we have a likely cis-regulatory site that is important for the life of the cell. Okay, let's transition uh, to slide seven. Um, here, I just want to remind us a little bit about the parts list that we're dealing with, that cis-regulatory sites, um, we use a little bit of a different nomenclature in eukaryotes. I've talked a little bit about this previously, so this is just a very brief, um, a very brief reminder. Uh, but remember, promoters, a promoter is a promoter the world around, but eukaryotic promoters are more complex. They bind more proteins. We don't simply have the minus 35 and minus 10 site interacting with, for instance, sigma factor and uh, the core RNA polymerase holoenzyme like we do in prokaryotes. Remember, we have the TFs, TF2, A through F, all of these different transcription factors, TADA binding uh, factor, all of which are required uh, at the core promoter uh, in uh, eukaryotes. But we see clusters of cis-regulatory regions associated with the start site of transcription. Those are promoters in eukaryotes. Um, cis-regulatory sites that are scattered far away from the start site of transcription, if when a transcription factor binds to them or a DNA binding protein binds to them, if that stimulates transcription of their associated promoter, we describe that cis-regulatory site as an enhancer. So enhancers enhance transcription, elevate the rate at which transcripts accumulate within the cell. Um, we also have 
uh, CIS regulatory sites analogous to what we saw with operator, where repressor bound to operator and that prevented transcription from occurring in the case of black operon physically excluding RNA polymerase from occupying the promoter site. Um, we similarly have cis regulatory sites called silencers that bind repressor proteins. When that repressor protein is bound, it makes transcription less likely to occur from nearby promoters. Um, thinking about the partnership from a eukaryotic perspective, we will often say enhancers partner with transcription activator proteins or transcription factors, depending on which nomenclature uh, you want to use. Um, repressors uh, bind with silencers. So there, the silencer site in DNA will bind with the repressor protein. That protein will then go and interact with RNA polymerase uh, or other components of the core uh, transcription machinery and will make it unlikely for transcription to occur. Um, another thing that we see with eukaryotes because of uh, their very interesting uh, genome evolutionary history is whereas in prokaryotes, we will usually see what we call focused promoters. There will be one promoter. Every transcript from an operon will essentially have uh, the same five prime end of the transcript. There are many eukaryotic genes because the genome has a history of these jumping genes called transposons or um, viral infections occurring, uh, integrating into DNA. Um, there are many genes, this is particularly true in plants, it's very well characterized in plants, although there's also a gene in zebrafish that I've worked with called the microphthalmic transcription factor, MIDF, f um, where you have uh, different transcriptional start sites associated with the same gene. So rather than a focused promoter, you may have dispersed promoters. If we transition from slide seven, eight to now slide nine. There's a nice little YFG uh, set of diagrams here, one of a gene with a focused promoter where there is one transcription start site. Every mRNA has its same five prime end. And another YFG where we're showing um, diffuse, dispersed, if you will, uh, promoters. And uh, there are multiple transcripts that are produced each of which has a different five prime end. Um, with the microphthalmic transcription factor, if we're looking in uh, mice, we see that there is one length of transcript that occurs in one context in cells that are called neural crest cells, another length of transcript that um, occurs if you are in olfactory epithelia, or uh, I'm sorry, retinal pigmented epithelia. So um, uh, these dispersed promoters may also be integrated into different regulation uh, depending, but we do see them fairly commonly with eukaryotic genes. Okay, let's transition to slide uh, 10. So um, previously when we were talking just in a broad sense about uh, transcription initiation, we've talked a little bit about eukaryotic promoters. If you'll remember, we talked about um, initiator regions. We talked about Tata boxes, um, the uh, TF2B recognition elements, BRE, other downstream promoter elements, and uh, the Motif 10 elements, GC boxes, CAT boxes. Um, promoters can have quite a bit of cis regulatory complexity around them in addition to uh, the short stretch of DNA where transcription initiates. Um, most of those sites are for binding specific proteins that interact with uh, the core uh, RNA polymerase holoenzyme. So um, if we transition to slide 11, uh, we see just kind of again a, a YFG example of just sort of a garden variety promoter region associated 
uh, with the uh, start site of transcription of a gene. Um, upstream of the start site of transcription, you have the Tata box and its other associated cis regulatory sites. Because remember, the uh, AT rich region in eukaryotic genes is where Tata binding factor binds, and it is generally upstream of the start site of transcription. Whereas in prokaryotes, the AT rich stretch of regions. Uh, usually between the minus 10 and plus one box. That is actually the region in which the uh, helix melts to allow access to the uh, template strand of DNA for transcription of the complement of uh, mRNA. So, you know, it's interesting because you have AT rich regions, but their purpose is different. If we're looking at prokaryotes, that's where the helix melts. If we're looking at eukaryotes, that is the region, generally speaking, if it is a well-defined Tata box, where Tata binding protein binds. So if, if we think about this just in relation to a very simple prokaryotic promoter with a minus 10 site, uh, an AT rich region associated with the start site of transcription, uh, a minus 35 site, which we think is uh, more closely associating with um, uh, sigma factor that is part of the RNA polymerase holoenzyme. Well, here, what are we seeing? This kind of general theme of eukaryotes are more complex in how they do things. Uh, evolution has caused more regulation to accrete, <laughs> if you will, to promoter regions. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Um, my, my, a uh, colleague and friend, Elliot Goldstein at Arizona State University, uh, always used to say that uh, mRNA polymerase in uh, eukaryotes just requires more midwifery. You, you need more proteins interacting with it, more cis regulatory sites. It just needs more help uh, to form a closed complex tightly associated with the promoter but not yet in a situation in which the helix has been melted and transcription has occurred. Has occurred. So I, I like that uh, image that uh, we've got a lot more help getting transcription started. That means we need more proteins that are present and we need more binding sites for them in the DNA. A little bit more molecular midwifery. Um, so kind of outside of the core promoter with its uh, scattered uh, Tata, Tata, binding pro, or Tata binding protein, Tata sites and other associated sites, what else are we seeing? What we've already talked about previously, cat boxes, GC boxes, and those are all required uh, for their appropriate proteins to bind to it to start um, transcription occurring. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to slide 12 and 13, because here we're transitioning between the world of using gene finding, where we're literally just using a text analysis um, to identify short stretches of DNA sequence that look like Tata boxes or look like cat boxes or look like GC boxes. And now we're moving to ask a deeper biochemical question, which is, is this little stretch of DNA sequence really integrated into the functional life of the gene? If we mess with one of these regions, if we go from cat, see, you know, I think the, I think the description here in 13 the cat box they're using has the consensus sequence CCAT. Well, if we put two Gs in there where the A's are, we're significantly changing the local sequence of DNA there. Is that enough to destroy that cat box through um, molecular mutation? Uh, and would that uh, result in a readout of lower levels of transcription occurring from this gene? Oops, I'm sorry, excuse me. <coughs> well, it turns out, pow, um, that is absolutely what we see. 
that these fairly well characterized boxes, GC boxes, cat boxes, and Tata boxes, they are functionally required for transcription initiation because if we mess with them, if we mutate them, if we cut, paste, uh, swap in, swap out other nucleotides, um, they lose their identity as cis regulatory sites. Their partner will no longer uh, their partner will no longer bind to them, and uh, in the absence of that partnership, you end up with a situation where the uh, promoter tends not to fire. So um, looking at figure 17.6 on slide 13, what do we see? We see a graph uh, showing on the y-axis relative transcription level, um, that is in relation to a control experiment where we're taking a mini gene, putting it into a tissue culture cell, allowing that cell's RNA polymerase and other cis uh, transacting proteins to regulate the gene and induce transcription. So when it says here relative transcription level 1.0, that's 100% of the mRNA that we would expect, where it says, Relative transcription level 3.0, that's three times the amount of transcript we would expect. 3.5, three and a half times the amount of transcript we expect. So what we're seeing there in that relative transcription level is the, if you will, relative molar amount of transcript against a standard. This active gene as we see it in tissue culture. If we move along the x-axis, what are we seeing? We're seeing a linear model of this particular <coughs> gene's cis-regulatory site near sites near the start site of transcription. On the left side of the graph, we have upstream of the start site of transcription. On the right side of the graph, you can see where it says initiation. That is where uh, the transcript initiates and the five prime end of the RNA transcript is produced. Moving along this region, what you see are areas where you see some lines that are kind of at 100% transcription, but then all of a sudden you'll see a region where those lines drop down precipitously. What does that mean? That is a nucleotide that has been mutated through site-directed mutagenesis. So for instance, if we're in a cat box, rather than having the sequence CCAAT, we may change the sequence to GCAAT, then take that mutated promoter, put it into tissue culture, and ask the question, does the promoter fire? Well, for instance, what you see here in the GC box is um, there are many nucleotides where if you do any change, you get down to perhaps 20% uh, of the level of transcript that is the standard. So mutating the GC box really reduces the probability that transcription will occur. Similarly, in the CCAT, the CAT box, you'll notice there are many nucleotides where you change them. Transcription becomes almost undetectable so mutating that cis-regulatory site means the transacting factor no longer can bind. In the absence of that binding, the promoter doesn't fire. Wow, you've made a dead gene. <laughs> so these are really severe. If you'll remember our allelomorphy discussion, these are really severe hypomorphic, very severe partial loss of function, or amorphic, complete loss of function mutant alleles caused by as few as a single nucleotide change. Now, interestingly, if you look at the space between the cat box and the Tata box, you'll see many nucleotides where the relative transcription level is 100%. Well, they've gone in there and they've changed nucleotides and the promoter's been like, I don't care. I'm going to start firing transcript. That's all good. I'm going to make tons of transcription. No problem. So that's showing, ah, the GC box, the cat box, the Tata box, mutate those, transcription crashes. Other nucleotides, they are permissive to mutation. You change those, why? Well, 
they're just kind of stuffer, they're filler. <laughs> they're, um, that doesn't interact with specific transcription factors. And since they're not cis-regulatory sites, their sequence is not under strong evolutionary conservation and mutating them does not cause an impact of transcription. So this is a somewhat lengthy discussion. I apologize, but it's quite fascinating because this says a cat box isn't just something that we see in sequence and go, oh, there it is. A Tata box isn't just something we see in sequence and go, oh, Tata, oh, there it is. Mm. No, we can find lots of sequences that look like Tata boxes. How do we know for sure they're important? We mutate them. If we mutate them and the promoter goes, wow, I can't fire anymore. I can't transcribe. Pow you found a real Tata box. Pow, you found a real GC box. So mutation is a powerful tool that allows us to kind of bridge between information we see doing gene finding, site finding along DNA, and knowing for sure that we found a functionally integrated site, a site that the physiology and biochemistry of the cell cares about. Okay. Uh, again, send me any questions, fpicket at luc.edu, no problem, happy to chat. And I think on YouTube too, eh, I've never really used the commenting stuff, but if you comment, I'll try and help with that too. I know these are strange times. Um, okay, so let's transition to slide 14. Uh, this is section 17.4 in Clug and Cummings. Eukaryotic transcription initiation is regulated by transcription factors that bind to cis-acting sites. Now, this is a refresher of our discussion in general of eukaryotic transcription activation, which we did in a previous uh, general discussion of transcription. So I don't want to spend a huge amount of time with it, um, but this just reminds you that activators bind enhancers, repressors bind silencers, and uh, that if we look at um, how uh, proteins kind of are coming together to get transcription uh, supported or prevented, it's all about those partnerships. Now, <clears throat> at this point, I'd like to transition from kind of general YFG models to talking a little bit about the regulation of a specific gene. Um, the authors have settled upon, I think it's quite a fascinating gene. This is a human metallophion and 2A gene. And uh, this is a gene that is generally involved in stress responses, but is in particular involved in cation heavy metal responses. Um, and we'll see why that is. Uh, if you have uh, problems with metal poisoning in a eukaryotic cell, this protein tends to turn on. So this is quite fascinating, but here somewhat analogous uh, to what we saw, for instance, with cyclic AMP binding to uh, uh, catabolite activating protein and then activating the transcription of the lac operon. Here, we're going to see metal ions are going to be our small effector, <laughs> our effector element, if you will, <laughs> even, even more simple than a sugar. And um, they are going to be small effectors by interacting uh, through a somewhat complicated system with glucocorticoid receptor, which is a nuclear receptor molecule, it binds to uh, cis-regulatory sites and activates um, HMT2A uh, uh, in response to this metal approach. So again, not completely identical to what we're seeing in prokaryotes, but conceptually very similar. Small effector binds to transacting factor protein, transacting factor protein, regulates the transcription of a resulting gene. One thing I really like about, uh, about HMT2A is that its cis-regulatory logic and transacting factors have been very well characterized. I'm not gonna talk a ton about them, 
but um, there is a very nice gene model on slide uh, 19. Um, if we look at uh, the cis-regulatory analysis of this gene, what do we see? We see a lot of things that we expect. We see the initiator region, INR. We see TADA for TADA binding protein. Uh, we see some GC boxes. We see some MRE boxes. Um, we uh, see a start site of transcription. So this is slide 19, figure 17.7. But I direct your attention well upstream, 250 base pairs upstream, five prime in relation to the transcript start site, three prime in relation uh, to the template. You'll see a GRE, this is glucocorticoid response element. That is a cis-regulatory site. And the protein that binds to it is shown here in cartoon form, glucocorticoid receptor. Again, this is the molecule that mediates I'm having a crisis of being exposed to metals. It also plays a role dealing with other types of stress responses, which we won't get into in the context of this course. Um, but uh, if a cell is experiencing metal poisoning, the cell can mobilize transcription of HMT2A as a stress response to try and mediate that um, because it will begin to sop up metal ions. Uh, but how does that happen? Glucocorticoid receptor activates transcription of the gene and that causes transcription of HMT2A to occur and the transcript accumulates, the protein accumulates, the cell can then begin a physiological recovery. So whether eukaryotic or prokaryotic, the same constraints are there. We want to, we want to, I'm anthropomorphizing. Cells activate transcription of um, genes because the proteins that will be translated from that transcript are important for the life of the cell given a condition that the cell is under. If I'm being metal poisoned, I wanna make a sponge for the metals. I want to try and overcome some of those um, uh, issues. I want to regulate other genes that are involved in uh, dealing with a metal crisis. And so that's exactly what we see here. Um, we don't want those genes to be on constitutively. Why? Well, uh, remember, um, <laughs> you know, nitrogen ain't cheap. Phosphorus ain't cheap. Fixed carbon is not cheap. Um, also, you don't want a cell to just be expressing every gene in the genome all the time because that will likely affect uh, its tissue stability, uh, its cell division cycle stability, et cetera. Regulating genes is important for integrating their function into the life of the cell. Okay. Now, <clears throat> transitioning on from uh, this nice little model gene and its uh, uh, transcriptional expression under the regulation of a nuclear receptor transcription factor like glucocorticoid receptor, um, let's talk a little bit more about transcription factors. What is the structure of these proteins that makes them uh, good uh, switchers, switches for activating transcription? Um, often what we'll see with transcription factors is that they have novel domains. I've talked with you guys previously about the idea uh, that many of these proteins are Swiss Army knives they have different domains that do different things. <laughs> a Swiss Army knife might have a knife, it might have a scissors, it might have a toothpick, it might have a bottle opener. That lets you do a lot of cool stuff on your camping trip because each of those tools physically integrated into one object can be used independently of the others. Well, that's often, I think, a way to think about what we're seeing with transcription factors. They have specific DNA binding domains where they interact with their cis-regulatory site and bind quite closely to it. 
but then they also have what these authors are describing as transactivating domains, other regions of the protein that allow it to interact with things like elements of the core transcriptional machinery, um, other components that are uh, associated with promoters, enhancers, um, but uh, that transactivating domain usually causing protein-protein interactions or mediating protein-protein interactions allows transcription activation or repression to occur. Now, they talk about some of the specific domains. I don't really get into that uh, too deep in uh, genetics, but it's just to highlight that there are different gene families. They talk about the helix turn helix families, the zinc finger families, the basic leucine zipper families. These are all domains that allow protein to interact with specific cis-regulatory sites, but based on different amino acid structures, charge, relative position, conformation, they can interact with distinct cis-regulatory sites. They have novel sequences. They may or may not be similar to each other, um, but uh, uh, they're there to provide that region of the DNA that allow, or that region of the protein that allows it to bind specifically to cis-regulatory sites in DNA. Now, <clears throat> uh, transitioning to slide 23 and later, again, this really is review of what we've already talked about, about eukaryotic uh, transcription. I think the authors, just in the context of this uh, uh, chapter, wanted to remind you about the general transcription factors. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time reviewing it because I generally don't in the class, but this just reminds us that Tata binding protein um, and uh, its associated ta uh, transcription factors along with the other TF2 derivatives has to assemble before RNA polymerase is brought in, that you have a closed complex first until helicase and other components opens the DNA and allows the open complex to occur, i.e. the actively transcribing complex to occur as RNA polymerase moves away from the promoter. I generally do not ask the class to memorize all the TFs. Uh, I kind of feel like that's counting the number of Legos in the Millennium Falcon kit. Uh, if the MCAT is asking you to memorize the specific roles of all the transcription factors, I, I apologize. You will have an opportunity to dive into it a little more deeply in biochemistry. Um, just remember, it's midwifery, <laughs> right? You need a lot of help to get mRNA polymerase to activate. We're not in the prokaryotic world. We're simple sigma factor, uh, minus 35, minus 10 site, and the uh, RNA polymerase holoenzyme are sufficient. We need a lot more help to get uh, a high affinity, highly processive um, uh, open transcription complex to form in eukaryotes. So um, <clears throat> transitioning from 24, 25, and 26, uh, this is really here just to remind me, to remind you that um, DNA methylation, we've talked a little bit about epigenetic regulation, DNA methylation, uh, histone modification, these are important uh, at varying levels from gene to gene and organism to organism in terms of regulating um, level and extent, tissue specificity of expression, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> certainly epigenetic regulation has become something we certainly can measure, we can assess the methylation state of DNA. We can assess um, with chromatin immunoprecipitation and other uh, technologies the levels at which modified uh, histones are present associated with any um, active or inactive gene. And so um, it's increasingly uh, thought that these epigenetic changes, methylation of DNA, modification of the histones, are important 
two varying levels on a gene to gene and tissue to tissue basis for uh, regulation of expression. Um, colleagues that I've had working with things like decidabine, other uh, well-known pharmaceutical molecules that uh, play an important role in modifying uh, the presence or absence of these epigenetic regulatory signals may uh, argue with you <laughs> about the relative importance for any individual gene of any individual uh, epigenetic uh, signal presence or absence. Um, I think for the context of this course, it's simply important to know that almost certainly uh, they are playing varying roles from gene to gene in terms of whether or not transcription will occur or be less likely to occur from any individual given promoter. Um, <clears throat> so thinking about the YFG, where for instance, we may have enhancer A tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of base pairs away from the promoter, um, you might ask yourself this question, how does a protein bound, uh, thinking about one of the major uh, limb enhancers for uh, sonic hedgehog, um, you might have an enhancer a million base pairs away from the core transcriptional machinery assembling at the promoter. How does this protein so far away interact with that core complex? Um, for many years, uh, certainly uh, during my training, there was a bit of a controversy. There was this sort of creeping regulation model that uh, <laughs> molecules, proteins would bind at cis regulatory sites and kind of wiggle along, hop along the DNA until finally they would interact. They would kind of spread their information until finally they would interact. But then there was also the DNA bi uh, bending model where proteins would bind at cis regulatory sites distal from the start site of transcription, would bend the intervening DNA, and would be able to then have electrostatic and other types of contacts with the core transcriptional machinery. Um, that model does seem to be correct. Using protein-protein uh, cross-linking and other types of approaches, uh, these big loops where proteins are interacting with core uh, components and they're attached to a huge uh, uh, lasso, if you will, of DNA, um, those structures have been found quite routinely. So this leads to a model that's shown on uh, slide 28 of enhanceosome and DNA binding structure where a cis-regulatory enhancer with its appropriate transcription factor, then uh, other proteins through protein-protein interactions may be interacting with transcription factors, uh, components of mediator, which is a, another protein set. Uh, it's a whole protein family that interacts with uh, RNA polymerase II. So we do think that this model of enhanceosomes forming where at a even very large distance from the start site of transcription, a protein bound to cis regulatory site can kind of through Brownian motion, random molecular motion and high uh, affinity contacts between proteins and the core polymerase can form these bending structures. We don't think that enhancers are sites where proteins bind and slide. We think that enhancers are sites where proteins bind and bend the intervening DNA. All right, so um, that transitions us to uh, slide 29, getting ready to move into chapter 18. I think I will go ahead and edit and post this and then uh, put up the remaining materials uh, as we move through the week. I hope you guys are all well. Do not hesitate to send me an email uh, if I can be of any service in any way this summer. And I'm sending every positive thought your way, my friends. Thank you, have a good day, and uh, thank you for your attention.